My name is Karika Walden. I'm a scientific research at the University of Oxford, and I'm extremely excited today to be talking to the legendary Philip Sharp. Ooh. I, for me, I'm a splicing person, and so to sit here and talk to the co-discoverer of splicing is really big for me. How is that for you to kind of be like a scientific celebrity? Well, I try to resist celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> it gets in the way of, of knowing people and mm -hmm. doing work. Um, I'm very proud of, course. Uh, of uh, being able to make that contribution and introducing the word RNA splicing. Mm -hmm. And it's fabulous coming back here to Cold Spring Harbor for the symposium and seeing uh, you know, a whole symposium about RNA and RNA splicing and many other topics all uh, that are around this magical molecule of RNA. And it's just been uh, an extraordinary uh, sort of 40, 45 years. Yeah. So, I mean, going back to that, you were here, I'm sure, for many other symposia. This is the 84th symposium. Yes. And the kind of transformation of the field, I mean, I can only but imagine I'm, I guess, like a, a fetus in the field, to be honest. <laughs> um, I've only been around for a few years. But, I mean, to, for me, when you learn in university about yeah. RNA expression yeah. and yeah. gene yeah. regulation, you, you learn about these crucial things that you don't even realize at the time the person who discovered it is still alive. <laughs> so it, like, how is it for you, like from the other side, to kind of see where the field has gone to today from where it was when you first came on? So I was at Cold Spring Harbor. Mm -hmm. I worked here for three years. Um, and that was in 71 to 74. Okay. And before that, I was at Caltech where I was two years and uh, was working in bacteria and did electron microscopy of uh, the DNAs of plasmids and the mapping genes on the chromosomes mm -hmm. of uh, E. coli. It was genomics before genomics was called genomics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew at Cold Spring Harbor I wanted to begin to work on tumor viruses. Okay. So I, in mammalian cells, because I knew I could do very detailed studies mm -hmm. with these DNA tumor viruses. I knew how to do microscopy of DNA and RNA. So I, I came to Cold Spring Harbor to learn how to work with DNA. In those days, working with mammalian cells was considered by the molecular biology community a waste of time. Okay. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'm sure they can uh, change that. Well, you know. they changed it, but you know, there was a few pioneers, uh, Jim Darnell and a few others. And when Jim came uh, to Cold Spring Harbor to be the director of Cold Spring Harbor, he started the initiative on cancer. It was okay. uh, the period of the war on cancer. And uh, that I came because I wanted to learn how to work in mammalian cells. I wanted to use DNA tumor viruses. Uh, that was the theme that uh, Jim was putting together because mm -hmm. these viruses have a few genes that cause tumors in, in mice. And we wanted to know how a gene could cause a tumor. Yeah. So we started working with uh, and studying these viruses. And um, it, I began to read about the molecular biology in mammalian cells. And um, I came on this phenomena that uh, in the nucleus of you know, human cells, there was this long RNA called heterogeneous nuclear RNA. It had you know, a poly A tail that the three prime end had a cap at the five prime end. So it had most of the modifications we knew about uh, in message, mm -hmm. but it was five, ten times larger. Okay. And no one was paying any attention to it. <laughs> it was just sort of the mystery that no one could figure out how to, how to investigate. But I knew adenovirus, uh, when infected in human cells, had the same long nuclear RNA, shorter cytoplasmic. And that was... Uh, something I kept my eye on. I mm -hmm. said, I know how to solve that problem for adenovirus. I didn't know if it'd tell us anything in general, yeah. but I knew how to solve the, the issue of what the relationship was. And I left here in 74 to go to MIT. Mm -hmm. And we did the electron microscopy of uh, the RNA from the cytoplasm of the cell compared to the DNA in the nucleus. And there were these three 
<laughs> beautiful <laughs> loops. And it told us that this long nuclear RNA was a precursor to the cytoplasmic RNA. And the term RNA splicing uh -huh. was the <laughs> thing that removed the middle of it. And so that um, became a paper which was published in 77 mm -hmm. and was a sort of discussed here at Cold Spring Harbor in the 77 symposium. Okay, well. It was around chromatin, but the RNA took the show. Yeah, of <laughs> Yeah, chromatin. Was, <laughs> yeah, no. So the RNA took the show. And uh, so, uh, and then the field has grown. I mean, it just exploded yeah. after that because everyone, many labs could begin to clone human genes mm -hmm. and genes from other mice and others. And here were these introns and these introns are between the exons that code for the protein that had to be spliced out. And it just, within six months, everybody wow. who was literate <laughs> <laughs> uh, knew about this discovery of split genes and RNA splicing. And it was a, a, a remarkable time, absolutely remarkable time. I'm just picking up on, you know, the fact that you would have brought this here to the 77 Symposia and kind of the reaction from people at the time, I guess they were they shocked or were they as excited as you were? They were stunned. Okay, wow. Because in every major lab, they had data in their notebooks. Uh, they had been ignoring. Okay. Because they couldn't explain it, wow. and they were sitting there. I mean, I was sitting on the back lawn of of uh, the Blackford Hall after a, a, some dinner and. Here, Richard Flavel, who was working on beta globin, and he had this re restriction cleavage site in the middle of the cellular gene, but it wasn't in the middle of the of the message <laughs> okay. of the cDNA. Right. So he, he he couldn't figure out why there was this restriction <laughs> inside. And he said, "There's a restriction inside in there," and I said, "Just listen," <laughs> and then he went home and within. You know, a, a month he, he had, he had uh, described that there was an intron factors too. Wow. In, in Globin. And, uh, and this was, you know, Peter, uh, Pierre Chambon in Strasbourg and, and Phil Leader at the National Institute of Health and, and Susuma Tamagawa and Molly Gilbert had sequenced uh, the V region of a nimic globulin gene. And there was this little sequence in the middle of the sequence that coded for amino acids that was meaningless. <laughs> and they couldn't figure out how uh, it was dealt with. Yeah. And then splicing. It's fixed all of that. Fixed all that. Fixed it all. Yeah. I mean, for me, it, it's, it's almost like you're showing the light, right? I mean, and it's, it's funny <laughs> because you're saying like everyone had this kind of unexplainable yes. results, it didn't, didn't look into it, yeah. but it good thing you did. Yes, I did. mean. Uh, good thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, for all of us. Yeah. I mean, my, yeah. my, my own work is based on alternative splicing. I wouldn't oh. have a project yeah. if you didn't look into it. So thank and you for that. we're still struggling with alternative splicing, as you know. Yeah. Uh, because it varies from cell to cell. And uh, even though we only have 23,000 genes. Mm -hmm. I think they may have lost a few genes. I think it might be closer <laughs> to 22, yeah. 21,000. Um, every one of those genes are spliced in different patterns by exactly. alternative splicing, making different proteins in some cells. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. until we got the technology, and that's only the last year or so, to do RNA sequencing from a single cell, exactly, yeah. we really didn't know what gene was expressed, what type of gene was expressed in each of the cells, and we know that it makes a difference because if you perturb this alternative splicing, in many cases, you see a phenotype, a change. Exactly, exactly. So um, it's it's we're still, even though we're in the genomic era and we can do all this and we can do all that, mm -hmm. we're still struggling with the complexity of these biological systems. And that's the beauty of science, right? I oh, mean, yeah. It's I was going to keep you employed. Exactly, exactly. Well, <laughs> thank God. Um, there's always something else to study, right? Yeah. Um, before we get to where you are now and what you're studying now and why you're here yeah, you know, yeah, to present yeah, at the symposia, yeah. um, let's just skip forward in our conversation, but take us back a little bit from present day to 1993. Okay. 
I was three. So you were three? <laughs> okay. Three. Uh, and you weren't following the news? I, I wasn't. Because oh. I think I was probably playing in the sand in some way. Um, okay. But okay, that was a big year for you. Yes, it was. The year you won the Nobel Prize. Yes. What was that like? Breathtaking. Um, the, the way prizes work mm -hmm. in science and the way it is in other disciplines where they get prizes is that you get prizes early in your career if mm -hmm. you've done noteworthy work. And then when you get those prizes, you look who had won before. And uh, you know when you get a prize and one in four of the people who had gotten that prize before had gotten the Nobel Prize. Okay. You, you sort of get the feeling that yeah. they might be, you, know, you might be in a list somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but those prizes, I uh, had gotten a number of them with Tom Cech. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom uh, discovered self-splicing, that the okay. RNA in some introns would catalyze its own excision. And he got that with Sid all. In, in chemistry, and um, I assumed that they had recognized splicing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of great science in the world, uh, many, many worthy people for mm -hmm, recognition. So I had sort of relaxed okay. <laughs> <laughs> on Nobel Day. Okay. Uh, okay, Nobel Day is... Uh, it's probably is, better, actually. What? To be, so, to be so, unexpected and... Yeah, unexpected. Yeah. I was relaxed, and I was in bed the morning, and. Here it's six in the morning. It's Columbus Day holiday in New England. Okay. They give a holiday because the leaves and trees are so beautiful. Everybody takes off anyhow. So uh, I was in bed, you know, sleeping in a little late, and the phone rings, six in the morning. Okay. And I said, hmm, who's calling me at six? And this is the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the morning. I, the morning. This is the morning. Everybody knows the morning. Mm. So I pick up the phone and uh, it's a, a Swedish colleague who had just uh, come out of the uh, committee meeting mm -hmm. and uh, said it had been announced that uh, I was uh, um, chosen as a Nobel uh, laureate that year with Rich Robert. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, I uh, it took a minute to, <laughs> to digest this. And then uh, he asked me if uh, I had the telephone number of Rich Roberts <laughs> because they didn't have the telephone number. He had just moved from Cold Spring Harbor up to uh, New England Biolabs. And mm -hmm. I, I tried to find it. And after I called my wife in and she squealed and jumped up and down, <laughs> we. Uh, uh, you know, I said you're going to, have to find us somewhere else. I had just no chance. I'm yeah. going to be able to do anything. So, um, and the day was just unfolded like that. So I, wow. I get a call from MIT, wanting me to be there at ten in the morning okay. for a press conference. Of course, yes. And I go and I have some champagne with my assistant, and then I. <laughs> have the press conference, I have champagne, I go to lunch with the dean, I, I have champagne, <laughs> go to the department, I have champagne, okay. I go home, we have a block party, oh, and wow. I have champagne. <laughs> and then I go home, and the next morning, uh, the dean of science at MIT calls me and says, we want you to talk okay. this afternoon at two in the afternoon on what you did to get a Nobel Prize. And I said, who am I going to be talking to? He said, well, we're going to advertise it to all of MIT. Okay. <laughs> so 17,000 people. Wow. <laughs> no, but it was about <laughs> 600 people showed up. And I had to put together a talk, very general talk about right, the subject. Yeah. Uh, but it turned out to be one of the most pleasant, exciting moments uh, uh, to share it with those people who knew me and and... Yeah, didn't know the work, but was so excited about you know MIT uh, and a faculty member of yeah. MIT getting that recognition. So, really uh, uh, a wonderful time. So, if you get offered a Nobel Prize, oh. please say yes. I, I don't think I was going to say no. <laughs> no, well, I was just, just giving you some okay, friendly okay. advice. Okay, I, I take that. Okay, I appreciate okay. that. Yeah, and I think I mean, for me as well. I mean, it must be for all of us young scientists. That is like. 
No price. That's. I mean, I've had people say, "Oh, you need to get a Nobel Prize." I'm like, <laughs> "How do I do that? Like, that's just so much pressure." But for me as well, what's kind of awesome is to see that okay, you get a Nobel Prize, awesome year, awesome yeah. day. Yeah. But there's still loads of science to do, and so yes. if you can just tell us what you're going to be talking about, is it tomorrow about your new recent work? And the, you know the fact that you haven't just stopped at splicing and you no, no, kept I'm, going I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to venture on to see yes. what else is there. Well, I'm going to talk about a a breakthrough now. It's not my breakthrough. Mm -hmm. The breakthrough was done by Tony Hyman okay. and Cliff Brandewein. Cliff Brandewein is at Princeton. Tony Hyman's at Max Planck in Dresden, Germany, and they um, recognized that many of the membraneless subcellular bodies in cells, and if you look at a cell through a microscope, you see a nucleolus and you see other mm -hmm. dense particles. Those dense particles are created by what is called a phase transition. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a number of molecules that have valency and they coalesce, and they make a concentrated body. Okay. And in those concentrated bodies, very important reactions occur. And um, so they are critical for those reactions. They make them uh, work at the, the rate and pace that they needed to work. Okay. Uh, they can be dissociated and reformed, and that's a form of regulation. Uh, and what I've been working on and will continue to work on in the last, uh, started about two years ago with colleagues at MIT, is how that process is central to the transcriptional process that copies RNA from the DNA. Mm -hmm. So that's where you, that's your major point of regulation. Right. You know, every cell in your body has the same DNA. Exactly. But some cells are skin cells and some cells are blood cells. They, they, they express that subsets of genes differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you get diseases like cancer, the genes change in their expression level mm -hmm. and that causes the growth. So that regulation of genes, turning them on and off, involves this condensate process. And now it's a very important insight because now we're going to be able to pinpoint the signals that come okay. into the cell that turns genes up and down. Mm -hmm. And if and as we learn how to do that, we will learn how to control that. So that'll help us you know, be able to treat diseases that we can't treat now. Um, all the way from from you know cancer to Alzheimer's. I mean, it's right. uh, it's it's a really surprising that we've been working on cell biology for all these years, and it wasn't until about ten years ago that somebody made the insight that this whole process occurs. And now it sort of tumbles forward and people learn about it and they, they then relate their work to it. Right. And, and it's, it's growing and growing and growing in tempo. And this symposium is sort of official recognition because there's a session on this, mm -hmm. that this is very general and very important. So I, I am really excited about that. It sounds exciting. And what I wanted to kind of end on is You've come from the beginning yes. of this field of RNA splicing. Uh, we are where we are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have things such as technology, as you mentioned, yeah. that has gotten better. Single cell RNA seq, long read RNA sequencing. Yeah. A lot of things happening now. Where do you think we will be in, say, another fifteen years? Oh, the first thing to answer that question is. I can't, I know that anything I say to you is going to be wrong. Okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> and no one's going to hold you to it. <laughs> and and, and, and I'll, if I am here 15 years ago from now, I'll be dramatically surprised about what's happening. But where I think we're going to go, <laughs> yes. okay, is that we're going to be seeing the integration of intense computing. Mm -hmm into the modeling and understanding of how cells function. Okay. Because as we've been talking, and it's been clear, 
the complexity of cells is just more than the mortal mind mm -hmm. can deal with. It's true, yeah. So, but to make progress now, I can't think gene by gene. I have to think relationships between genes and relationship between genes and relationships of the physiology of the body. That's the challenge we're at now. And that's going to require the integration of the capacity to compute and to relate and to communicate right. to each other. Mm -hmm. And we will make predictions and go in the lab and test them and whatever, and we will work to expand that knowledge. But we need that tool of what's called systems and our, our, our computational biology to make that next step. And that, I think, is going to happen in the next 10 years. And that will change our vocabulary. It'll change how we, we even talk at symposiums. We're going to be you know, walking through and sort of stereochemistry <laughs> saying that piece of the cell is working with that piece of the cell. And, and it's doing this, and you know, it'll it'll be Star Wars, but it won't be <laughs> boom, 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 shoot them up. Right. It'll be genes, proteins, and genes interacting and and changing how cells become malignant, and explaining and, and making predictions as to how one could intervene with it. It's a, it's a totally exciting field. I mean, it's a totally <laughs> exciting field, and um, I think that's where we're going to be. Well, I hope to be there as well when it happens. I would like to be around. I'm, I'm not going to be in there shooting, but I, 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 uh, I hope to be around to see it. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. It has Thank been you. with you too. Thank, Thank you. you.